the message that can't be contained right and all through the centuries you know if you read Psalm 2 it talks about man's rebellion to God the conspiracy of man against God okay we have time to look at it and yet God will have his way and in all of history this message the message of the cross has never been silenced <laughs> hallelujah what we're going to share on the day is about the atonement the atonement the word atonement this is funny this thing I can't get it done we're gonna to have to get a proper lectern in a few weeks <laughs> right the word atonement means a, a, it means reconciliation when you say the word atonement you can say it like this at one mint two parties that are separated made one again that's what Jesus Christ did on the cross that's what God in Christ has done on the cross when we talk about the atonement we talk about the cross Amen. Come on. hallelujah Come on. Romans 5 9 says this it says much more than listen if you get the message of the crosses this is not basic for the alpha course love alpha course will do alpha courses okay alpha courses are brilliant they get people saved you don't like oh well I don't need to learn about the cross no the cross is the main thing <laughs> much more than having now been justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him Romans 5 9 hallelujah that word justified is a phenomenal word a lot of the New Testament and Paul's letters borrows language from the world world of accountancy and from the law courts so for instance when it says count yourself dead to sin in Romans 6 it's the word lo, 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 logis mine or something I'm having a bit of a roll 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 Logismo or something. <laughs> I thought I knew the word. And it's, a, it's where we get the word logical from. And it's an accountancy word. Count yourself. It literally means count yourself. And the word justified, it's a legal term. Now we can understand that because I've accepted Jesus, who believes they're forgiven? You're forgiven? Yeah, That's not good enough. No. James is a nice guy. Not, he's, an, he's a good brother okay Joseph is a great man of God he's got integrity good, both got integrity by the way thank you okay if I stole 20 pounds of James James just look over there man. you're forgiven <laughs> <laughs> like this okay it's offering time reach into the person's pocket next to you take out their wallet and then give what you've been <laughs> you ever been in church and had that one pull on you right so James is looking away and I, t I, I, I take 20 pound off him now he says you're forgiven let's just say he's very angry at me because he needs that 20 pound and he feels like punching me in the nose but a few days later he forgives me and I'm forgiven but I'm still a thief yeah when you're justified you're for, it's more than forgiven you're no longer a thief yeah, amen. and you think but I did it but somebody else took the sentence for you yeah, it's a legal term if you get caught committing fraud I'm not going to say put your hands up if you've ever been to prison but really we're all sinners and we're all without Jesus are going to go to an eternal prison yeah. right and do everlasting serious time not going to be good okay so we've, 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 we've offended God's law we've sinned and so in a court of law somebody else has taken our sentence for us so that means justice is settled it's over and God declares you justified forgiven is not good enough because you're forgiven but you're still a thief oh well come on I'll let you into heaven thief <laughs> gossip liar adulterer fornicator no you're cleansed you're cleansed because of the atonement you're saved from wrath through him you're saved from condemnation you're saved from the condemnation that's on the world this world is under judgment 
This God is judging nations now. Okay, and there's a judgment to come. And we think, oh, hell's going to be awful and the devil and his pitchfork. It's not going to be the devil doing it to people. It's the wrath of God being poured out. I know, so this is really... Welcome to... <laughs> this is not, not very light, is it? That's the truth, though. We're justified. Now, look, you gotta, we've got to ask ourselves, is his blood good enough? You know, if, 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 I don't know, you wash your dishes and they still come out with grease on them because you bought a cheap washing up liquid, or you bought the best, is it good enough to clean? Is the blood of Jesus good enough, not just for our forgiveness, but to completely clean us? Because we don't feel good enough. Hey, get your eyes off you. Do you know what? You're worse than what you think. Because psychology is so much ingrained in us, and it's all me, myself, and I. No, we're worse than what we think, guys. The blood cleanses us. Romans 5.17 says, For if by one man's offence death reigned through the one. Who's that one man? That's Adam. The first human being sinned. Rebelled against God. We might think that's not fair. Is there anyone here in your life you've sinned? You have demonstrated that you were born a child of Adam. Who knows, and we've got some lovely children in this church. You don't have to teach a child a lie. No. Don't do you? Sin comes naturally. You know, Adolf Hitler, I'm sure, was a lovely little boy one time. The seeds of, I just tell you, the seeds of wickedness are in every single one of us. It's there in potential, right? And by that, death reigns. Whew. There's a reign of death. Death rules. There's a rule of death. God bless you. But it says, yeah, much more those who receive the abundance of grace. Now we were sharing about grace last week. Do you deserve to be saved? <laughs> we're so wired to earn God's favour. We've been justified by his blood. That means you're not just forgiven. Forgiveness is not good enough. You have to be declared not guilty as if you've never done it. Just as if I'd never sinned. And God will treat you that, like you're not a sinner anymore. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, man. Come on. Because if, listen, I don't believe in cheap grace. God disciplines us. He does. He disciplines his children. The, it is right to confess sin as a Christian. It's not right to do it in a robot way. Come on, man. We're having church, right? Next item, everyone confess your sins. So you have to drag up this shopping list of what a horrible. No, 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 I've done this wrong, I've done that wrong. That's not confession, it's sin. That's religion. Okay, and that's living in a consciousness of sin. Do you know what the biggest killer to moving in the power of God, moving in faith, is the consciousness of sin. Just feeling rubbish, condemned all the time. So when you sin, it's like in a relationship. A good marriage happens when we're honest with each other, isn't it? And, and, and over time, when you've been married for some time, you kind of see who, you, who each other really are. And, and you see the beautiful things in each other. Who knows, you see some of the ugly things in each other too. And some of the wounds and some of the hurts and the wrong attitudes. And it's a very, it's a very beautiful, it's, it's amazing how it works in God. And yet radical honesty is a wonderful thing for a great marriage, isn't it? And for good friendships. So when you mess up, now let's call it what it is. When you sin... Oh, but I've got issues. No, when I sin, I call it what it is. Come on. Right? The word confess means speak the same thing. In modern vernacular, call it what it is. Oh, but I'm like this because of my issues. I'm like, no. Stop that. Call it what it is. And when we call it what it is and just honest about it, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all that sin. It takes away all, this, all, all, all of that guilt. But you know what? God's working with us in discipline us. But I'll tell you. On the authority of God's word, God will never punish you. You've got to let that sink in. If you're a Christian, you have already passed from death to life. You're not in a hokey cokey salvation, in, out, in, out, shake it all about. It's not a license to sin. 
because if you went to a court of law and you got sentenced to five years in prison and you've done your sentence, sentence has been passed, sentence has been served and then you get hauled back in the court and charged for the same offence again and you're going to get sent to prison, is that fair? No. Your sentence has already been served and passed. Jesus has already taken of it. So the punishment has already happened. It wouldn't be legally just of God to punish you. Yeah. He can't. Not just because his hands are tied. He doesn't want to. Now listen, we can do stupid things. We can sow to our flesh. I've seen Christians train wreck their lives. You can end up in a world of pain. You can mess your marriages up. You can mess all. And yet God is always going to try and want to redeem and move us on. So we'll have to live without the fear of punishment. It's a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Yes, discipline. Yeah, and he'll rebuke us at times. And he says, you know, it's not, it's not pleasant. <laughs> but punishment, no. Punishment is for the devil. Punishment is for the lost in hell. Punishment is not for the believer. And so we're under grace. And what grace does, it brings us the gift of righteousness. And it causes you to soar Come on. like an eagle and to reign in life. Wow. Hallelujah. You know. It says here that it says death reigned. Death had a rule. Death ruled. This would be good if it said life now rules. Hey, that's good news. Instead of death ruling, now life rules. No, it doesn't say that. It says you rule in life. You rule in life. You reign in life. How? Through the one. Jesus Christ. You were in Adam, you're now in Christ. You're under a new headship. you ruling. It's not just like, oh, I'm, I used to be under death, now I'm under life. Death used to reign, death used to rule. Oh, under death, under death, under death. No, it's not just life ruling, I'm ruling in life. That means I'm like an eagle and life's under me. And you think, but I don't feel like this. This is not my Christian experience. I'm beaten down. And must. It's because you're under condemnation. Not from God. It's because you haven't yet understood the cross. Let's look at a few things that happened at the cross. You may have heard the term the divine exchange. The divine exchange. Quite a few things happened at the cross. At the cross, Jesus was punished that we might be forgiven. We know that. So, if, if he's being punished, there's no more punishment left. Oh, Jesus died for my sins. Not good enough. Jesus didn't just die for your sin. He was made sin. He became sin. It's better. Everyone has this. Well, I'm forgiven because Jesus died for my sins. That's not the gospel. I'm justified. I'm made righteous. If you are a Christian, oh, you are as righteous as God positionally in Christ. Listen, my kids are not perfect. One thing we're not perfect parents either one thing I've determined to do as a pastor they're not pastor's kids they're, they're people I'm not going to bring them up with shame you know gee I'm the pastor of your show <laughs> right now there are children you've got children they're of the same there's an equality with you they're in your family obviously there's a headship and stuff like that and they obey us but they're not our slaves if God is your father, you are of the same DNA. You have, what kind of spirit do you have in you? Do you have the unholy spirit or do you have the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is not going to live in a dirty, sinful, unforgiven, unjustified vessel. 
If you have the Holy Spirit, that is the absolute cast iron proof that God Almighty, Jehovah God, Yahweh, has accepted you, completely accepted you, case closed, as his child, and he's given you the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he's made you holy. Okay, you're not mature. Okay, your mind's not renewed. Okay, there's carnality in your life. And people, their heads get fried at this. Listen, in the New Testament, you've got like the Corinthian church, you've got, for instance, the Galatian church. The Spirit of God through Paul writes to these churches. The Corinthian church are a mess. There's lots of sinful carnality going on. That would make the daily mirror. And he rebukes them. He really does rebuke them. And there's lots of correction. And yet it's full of affection for them as well. The Galatian church, there's no immorality, there's no mess, there's no sin, they're as stiff as anything, the Spirit of God's not moving, and the Spirit of God through Paul has nothing good to say to them. He's scathing to them. And so we can be a religious church, clean on the outside, looking good, but no life. You know, we live in days, we live in a pagan country. Oh, I should be. Some of the way, you know, I believe in morality. Absolutely, I do. I believe in sex and marriage between a man and a woman. Hello, we live in an imperfect world. If, if, if people weren't messed up and in sin, they wouldn't need Jesus. Okay. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians 5 to 21 says, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us. Who made Jesus sin? God did. Where? On the cross. Jesus was made sin that we in him might become a little bit better. Put 2 Corinthians 5.21 up please. God made him who knew no sin for us for he hath made him there's King James, we don't have the new King James on here yet, we should for he hath made Jesus. Who made Jesus sin? God the Father did. He made him an offering for sin on that cross. He didn't just die for your sin. He was made sin. That we might be made a little bit improved in the sight of God. Slightly better. No. The righteousness of God in him. How righteous is God? Now your mind might fry at this and think, I'm, I could never be that holy. Of course you couldn't. That's why you needed salvation. Amen. Is Jesus Christ a resounding success? Or is he a failure? He's a resounding success. Salvation is of God. One thing about the atonement. The atonement is something that happened without your cooperation. Understand that. The atonement work of Jesus Christ on that cross happened without your cooperation, but it absolutely involves you. <sighs> Hallelujah. Oh. Jesus took our sentence of death that we might have his victorious everlasting life. This is divine exchange stuff. He was made a curse that we might receive the blessing. Jesus endured our poverty that we might have his abundance. Amen. We could spend a whole sessions on just one of these points. Jesus was made sick that we might be made healed and healthy. Jesus bore our shame. Shame's a big thing. That we might share his glory. Oh, but that's to come. It is to come, but it's also, there's a taste of it now. Amen. Jesus took our rejection so that we might have total acceptance with the Father. Amen. Complete. Accepted in the Beloved. Not like, oh come on in you fornicator, you liar, you thief. No, accepted in Him. That means God the Father accepts us. Exactly the same as he accepts his son, Amen. the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That means the quality of affection, the quality, the depth, the height, the width, everything, of the love 
that God has for the Son is the same love that he has for you. Hallelujah. But the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 1.18, this is just like an introduction today to the cross. Wow. It says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So it says in this scripture that the message, get this, how do I get the power of God in my life? We've heard this morning a testimony. A lady with Gilbert's syndrome, a blood condition, not life threatening, but it's not very nice. Incurable, completely healed. Because there's a man of power for the hour. Come on. Yeah, his name's Jesus. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. And where do you get the power of God? Where do you get the power of God? The cross. <coughs> cross. I think. I think our electricity comes from Ferry Bridge. Where does your electricity come from? Where does your TV signal? It comes from somewhere. It comes from somewhere. I love it. I've preached this scripture so many times. Galatians 3 says, You foolish Galatians. In the Greek he's saying, You stupid idiots. Jesus Christ was portrayed as publicly crucified before your very eyes. This only I want to know from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Where does the reception of the Spirit come from? From the preaching of the cross. Because the cross is the power of God. It's not, well the cross is an aspect of the power of God. No, the cross is the power. That word power is the word dunamis. I love that word dunamis. You wake up in the morning, oh Lord dunamis. The word dunamis in Greek means miracle working ability. Explosive power of God. The message of the cross is, not an aspect of, is the power of God. He said, look, Jesus was portrayed as crucified among you. How does God supply the Spirit and work miracles? By the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? By hearing the message? By taking it in, the message of the cross? You see, when you get miracles working in your life by the message of the cross, you're so grateful for it. Nobody's ego can get inflated. The preachers can't. Nobody can. You can go out on the streets and pray for the sick. And the minute you we think we're going to be the next Benny Hinn, praise God for that man. He's wrote some good, I tell you, his book on the blood of Jesus is good. Good morning, Holy Spirit is good. You know, we all want to, it's the cross. It's the cross. Because look, if we want the divine exchange, who wants the divine exchange working in their life? If you want the divine exchange to be working in you and through you, you've got to be plugged in to the power station source, which is the message of the cross. Because those who are being saved. Now if you know a little bit about theology, if you're a Christian, you have been saved. Okay, You are being saved and you're going to be saved. And salvation is of God. But you can live your Christian life and get... Um, you're still saved in that you're going to heaven. And you're saved from the wrath to come. But you've got unplugged from the Spirit of God. You've gotten into this self-improvement stuff. And this positive... Well, this is positive stuff, I tell you. And you get into that psychology stuff. And it unplugs you from the power source. It unplugs you from the message of the cross. And the divine exchange stops flowing in your life. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2. I like it from the Amplified Translation. This is Paul speaking. And he says, For I resolved, let's make a resolution today. Never mind January the 1st, we'll make some resolutions. We'll make a resolution today. He said this, I don't want to know anything. And this is an educated man. And it says, I don't want to know anything. I don't want to be acquainted with 
anything. I don't want to make a display of the knowledge of anything. There's people in this world just waffle about what they know. Oh, just get verbal diarrhea about all their knowledge. And Paul says, look, I'm fed up with that. I'm done with that. I don't want to make a display of the knowledge of anything. I don't want to be conscious of anything. Whew. You could explore meditation, biblical meditation right there. I don't want to be conscious of anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So he said in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 4 and 5, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 4 and 5, he said this, he says, My speech and my preaching are not in persuasive words of human wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17 he says, For Christ did not send me to baptize. Now why is he saying that? Because he's dealing with some issues in the church where they're saying, Well, you belong to this special anointed person over here because they baptized you and he did this and I'll follow Apollo and I'll follow Paul. And he's dealing with that. But he says this, he says, I'm sent to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. In the Amplified Translation it says, Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Right, let's stop there. Help Lord. Paul is saying, The wisdom of words, and he's speaking to a Greek culture. Some of us have heard this before. A Greek culture steeped in Greek philosophy, which is the foundation and the root of modern secular psychology. And he says, that wisdom empties the cross of its power. No more divine exchange working in your life. Oh, but it's wisdom. And it's, it's well, Paul says, look, I'm done with it. I only want to know Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I only want to be conscious of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Because we want the atonement. Who wants the power of the atonement to work in your life? At one minute. If your body's sick, it needs reconciled to the healing work of Jesus in the atonement at one month. If we're demonically oppressed, we need reckon that part of our life needs to be reconciled with the atonement work of Jesus. We need the divine exchange to be flowing, flowing in our life. Because the message of the cross is it's not an aspect of it is the power of God. We're gonna have to bring this into land really soon. Right, we're gonna look at some to finish off some very a very important aspect of the atonement. What caused God to make atonement for you? Think to yourself, what caused God Almighty, Yahweh, Jehovah God? And I'm a Gentile. What caused him to make atonement for me? Two things. One, the love of God. Two, the justice of God. Now I think in the generation we're living in, when we think of the cross, we more think of the love of God. And that's great, honestly, it's beautiful. But we need to understand the justice of God. If we have one without the other, we're unbalanced. If we, it's just the justice of God, we're too harsh. If it's just the love of God, we can be a bit flaky and a bit entitlement mentality. It's all about me and the whole universe revolves around me. Even God himself revolves around me. It's actually, it's all about me. Anyway, stop that. Just think about this, guys, right? Did God have to save us? Was it necessary, listen, was it necessary for God to make atonement for you? No, it wasn't. Because he didn't have to save you. He chose to save you. God didn't have to save anybody. 2 Peter 2 verse 4 says this. See, we're human beings. Anybody here, if you're a human being, wave your hand. 
human being. There are other created beings that sinned, rebelled against God, and I don't know why, but God chose not to save them. But for some reason, He's chosen to save us. It says, God spared not the angels that sinned. Now, they're a particular band of demons. There are demons on the earth today that will await their judgment. They can't be saved. But these are, are beings that were created like you. Created beings. We're created beings. With intelligence, with emotions, with intellect, with feelings. Able to relate to other created beings. These, whoever they are, we don't know. There's this bits about them in the Bible. These beings sinned against God. And God didn't save them. He didn't make an atonement for them. That's up to God. We don't know why. He sent them to hell. So God didn't have to make atonement for anybody. And let that settle in our heart because He's chosen to. Oh, God was lonely and He needed a friend. No, God's complete in Himself. There's nothing lacking in God. He's omnipotent. He's, he's, God is just awesome. There's nothing missing, nothing, there's nothing about him. God was ne God's never been lonely. God is God. It's just mind boggling that 10 billion, trillion, zillion, years ago, he's completely sound. No insecurities, no fears, completely at peace with who he is. Before anything was, he was. In an eternity future, there's nothing about, he never has an off day. Nothing lacking in him. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need anybody. He doesn't. God actually doesn't need us. Doesn't need you. But he chose you. <laughs> and if God, because God has chosen you, then it was necessary to make atonement for you. And this is one of the um, running right out of time. We'll pick this up next week. Romans 3, verse 25. We're going to... An introduction to a Bible word. The word propitiation. I hope I've said that right. Propit, propitiation. Have I said that right? Is that right? Is <laughs> My wife's smart, I'm not. I've been, we've been married a few years before she told me I was saying hallelujah wrong <laughs> so I was going around saying I won't even say what I was saying propitiation and it says God set forth Jesus as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness as lords we could come on about the rest of this the, the rest of this passage we could be weeks on this that word propitiation stick with this oh, it's theology it's it's helpful to understand the bible the word propitiation helasterion in greek means an appeasing sacrifice it was actually a word used a lot in greek pagan religions i.e. a pagan god had to be appeased an appeasement had to be made God the Father required an appeasing sacrifice to atone for us a placating sacrifice an expiatory sacrifice I don't want to be too high bro that word expiatory so that the wrath of God would expire. Now this can freak us out and say, God, ha I, I, God had to make an appeasement. Oh, but I've been saved. I've been saved from the devil. I've been saved from sin. Do you know who you're saved from? You are saved from God. God himself has saved you from himself. Because if you're not justified, and if we don't repent, there comes a day when that judgment, not for, it's not the devil and his pitchforks, it's his wrath that comes on us. It's not man's wrath, it's his wrath. We're saved from the wrath of God. And we struggle because this is a doctrine 
that's attacked in the church and there's people even now they say no the atonement is not that that makes God out to be something horrible that is not Jesus on the cross was simply showing love simply showing sacrifice and, man, and showing how man's violence can be done against him there's aspects of that are true but at the heart of the atonement is a very unattractive truth there's some things in the Bible are not nice not attractive but they're true and someone once said to me once not yet a Christian she said well I kinda like Jesus I like God but what about the dark side of God I eat things like this now the only person with darkness well in that case was this lady or us there's no darkness in God you see we tend to think how can a being have love and have wrath a hu if, if a human being was to encapsulate those qualities that human being would be a twisted awful wicked individual but a being who is the almighty omnipotent God can and is and so we're saved from wrath hallelujah it says, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, 1 John 2.2, 2. 1 John 4.10. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Just take this up, God has made an appeasing sacrifice in Christ. Now listen, if you were a pagan and you were worshipping your demon deity, so you can get a good harvest, a good crop, fertility, whatever it is, money. And you make your appeasing sacrifice, the slaughter of a chicken and an incantation and a ritual or a goat or something like that. And it comes about and you get your fertility and you get your crop. You think, okay, that sacrifice was accepted. It obviously did the job. Okay? You've been to Africa nine times, I'll come from there, you'll understand this stuff. You've got to ask yourself, is this, that's a, pro, that's a form of propitiation. Is the propitiation of the cross sufficient? Is it a resounding success or not? Because when you believe it, oh but I'm not good enough, you're worse than what you think. Just believe it. Just believe it, God, you know what? That's good news, I have that. Isaiah 53.10 It says this Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him We're finishing on this verse It pleased Yahweh, Jehovah God It pleased God Almighty to bruise him Who's him? Jesus That word bruise, that's weak In the Hebrew it means crush has anyone here in life ever felt crushed, condemned, humiliated and abused? Come on. Could you imagine? I mean, look, some of us in life, you've had someone in authority, someone you wanted to love and, uh, and treat you right, and that person crushed you. And because that person was powerful, because that person should have been a father figure, they're crushing you, really, really wounded you. Could you imagine what it would be like to have Almighty God do that? Because we think of the cross, and you've seen the movie, The Passion. You see the men put the nails into Jesus. Look, that's just a fraction. Who put Jesus on the cross? God did. Who crushed Jesus? Man. It was God. It pleased the Lord to crush him. Who crushed Jesus on the cross? Yahweh. Jehovah God who made Jesus' soul an offering for sin God you see when you get this it's not very attractive and there's a lot of people standing against this in the world today and all, all come to nothing when you understand this it's not mere love this is covenant love this is the source of the power of God this is what makes you righteous simply believe in it and I've told this analogy before and I'll make one last time and then we're finishing I'm watching that time 
We're going to have a clock in our new building facing the pulpit, okay? A man is in hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of debt, he goes to the bank. And the bank manager says, you can keep your house, but you've got to sell your car, sell everything. Send your wife out to work, and you might keep your house. That's the message of religion. But the message of grace is this. You go to the bank, and the bank manager goes, I'm so happy that you've humbled yourself to come here. All your debt is gone. You think, wow, that's good. No, that's just forgiveness. You're so broke, you're only at zero. Okay, and now we're going to put in your bank balance. The bank manager's saying, basically, I'm going to share everything I have with you. So your bank balance is the same as my bank balance for the rest of your life. <laughs> and something in you goes, hold on a second, I'm just going to. Is this guy stupid? Has anyone ever offered, imagine being offered a deal that's not fair, but it's in your favour? And you're going to think this person's either a clown and a complete nutcase, you realise, no, they're God. Or you think, well, this person's offering this, but they can't back this up with, no, they can, this is God. And know what the hardest thing for a human being to do is to go, thank you. I receive it. <laughs> it's the deepest form of repentance because it offends every part of your self-righteousness. It offends everything that's in a human being that says, well that's a good deal but I'll bring some of this to the table. It's an unfair deal. Say this, you remember, it is an unfair deal. In my favour. The atonement is an unfair deal in your favour. Forever. 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 And the deal is always, it never comes off the table. It's never rescinded. It's never repealed. It's not Obamacare. It's never repealed. It is permanent. Because I'm an appeasing sacrifice. The Bible says lots of things. <laughs> uh, it says mercy and justice have kissed one another, doesn't it? This is the message of the cross. It's the atonement. We're going to just stay in this for the next few weeks. So. Amen. It's grace. It's grace. It's grace. It sets you free. When you first hear it, you just feel like, what? You just want to dance. It's like wind under your wings. It just lifts you right up. It causes you to reign in life. Hallelujah. It just causes you to be ridiculously joyfully happy because you can't even uh, ever gain God's favour. Forget even trying. Just say yes. Anyone want to say yes to him right now? Hallelujah. Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. We'll finish right there. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Anyone being blessed today? Is there anyone here? You just the condemnation's gone. Hallelujah. Because this cleanses you. Say, this cleanses me. This takes away the consciousness of sin. By faith, I receive the abundance of grace. The gift. The gift. You've got to keep saying that. The gift. That means I can't earn it. Come on, the gift. If I say there's a gift, you go, thank you. I receive it. The gift of righteousness. Amen. By faith. Amen. I am. I am. And you say this with confidence, not with arrogance. It's actual hum humility. By faith in his blood, I am as righteous as God. Amen. <sighs> oh. Oh. We get the chains break. The chains break, the chains break, the chains break, the chains break, the sickness goes, the debt goes. How do you put a fire out? How do you put a fire out? You take the oxygen out of the fire. How do you get rid of the addictions? Take the guilt out, take the fear out. How do you do that psychology and twisting your head? No, the gospel, the message of the cross. Righteousness is a gift. Righteousness is a gift. So somewhere deep down in there, you think, even though I still mess up, I am righteous because of the blood. And then it's a 
say the roots. You know, everyone's trying to change this branch, change that habit, change that. Go to the root. Get the get the guilt and the fear and the condemnation out and put some righteousness in there. Put the righteousness of God in there. Put the glory of God in there and then watch everything else change. Hallelujah!